So today we're going to discover all about future meditation management. We're very lucky to have on our panel to presenters today. We've got Kazin Yakliff from, um, now this is a long, long uh, medica medication optimization pharmacy technician. Kaz, you've got a long title. Uh, you're, you're with the BNSSG and the ICB. So Kaz is joining us today. We've got Peter Thoyner, from, who's the chief medical officer from Hilltime. And we have Brian Brown, who's a pharmacist specialist from QC, sorry, CQC. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to stop talking and I'm handing you straight over to our first speaker, Kaz. Are you OK, Kaz, with taking the yeah. floor? Yeah. I'm I'll just share your screen. Do you, are you sharing your screen? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to do it now. All right. Lovely. Can you Perfect. see something? Yes, we can. Thank you very Excellent. much. Excellent. I can start now then. So hi, everyone. My name is Cass. So I'm a pharmacy technician working for the Integrated Care Board. We used to be called uh, CCG last year, Clinical Commission Group, group but we changed to uh, this name now. But we're still doing the same job. So like I said, I've been, I've been working for the ICB now for about eight years, and I've been working with the care homes as well for eight years. So some of you might recognize me here. So I'm coming to talk to you about proxy ordering. So it might be something new to you, or it might be something you're already using. So I'm going to start with what's proxy ordering. So basically, um, just to define Let's proxy is... So I can hear someone. Um, so to define proxy, proxy is a system that allows you to order medication online using the GP functionality. And what we're trying to achieve with proxy is we're trying to move from paper ordering to digital ordering. If I have time later on, I will show you what it looks like online and how you can order medication. But this is the main aim of proxy really is to have this. Why do we need proxy? There's many reasons for that, but um, and there's many benefits to have proxy in your care home as well. So first of all, it's gonna improve your communication and work in relationship with the GP practice. Because with proxy, and I will show you later, um, there's a communication box when you can um, communicate with the GP prescription clerks or your GP as well. So you can add information about any information about the medication you're ordering here. Um, it saves time as well because everything is done online. So it's going to be quick to order everything. You can select all the medication or select the medication required only. Uh, it reduces risk because it's a safe system to use and it's got an audit trail where you can use, you can check all the history of um, where you ordered medication or anything that you issued as well. Um, it's improved access because you can access it 24 hours 7, so you can order medication anytime, really. Um, I did mention about uh, audit trail. It's a secure as well uh, way of ordering medication because you will need access um, with passwords to the system. And it, it kind of improves the turnaround time for the queries you have with your GP practice. So. For you to have proxy, you need uh, some prerequisites. The first thing you need is an NHS email. And I believe in the BNSSG, Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire, we all the care homes should have an NHS email now. So at least, or you should have an organizational email. So that's your company email, which is deemed secure by NHS Digital. If you're not sure if you're email is in secure, you can send an email to NHS Digital and now we share the information later on how you do that. So the steps to have proxy in your care home, they're really there four steps, really easy ones, and I'm going to focus on the care home ones here. So first of all, you need to sign a data sharing agreement form. Um, it's all to do with the GDPR here. So that's one form you need to uh, complete. It doesn't take that long, it's about a minute or two to complete. So you give in some information to your GP practice about your information governance in your care home, and then you sign and date it and send it to the GP practice. 
Second step would be to create additional NHS emails. So like I mentioned previously, to have proxy, you need a individual NHS email for every member of staff ordering medication using proxy. So we have a website called Digital Social Care here. There's a link and they have really good guidance how to do that and they have a video. So it's a simple step. All you need to do really is send an email to a specific email uh, with the information about the member of staff that you want to um, have a NHS email. The third step would be for the member of staff to make a proxy account application. So there's a form as well here. They would need to complete that form. And what's really important here is that they need to use their NHS email. So once they get one in step two, they need to use that individual NHS email or their company's email that is deemed uh, secure by NHS Digital and use it to complete that form. So in step three, once you send this to your GP practice, what's going to happen? They're going to set you up with a proxy account and you're going to start um, receiving emails. The, this member of staff will start in, uh, receiving emails with the login uh, information. And they would need to set up themselves on the proxy account here, the patient access account. Um, really easy step. There's a few steps to it. And everything is explained here again with the uh, videos and everything there for you to do. It shouldn't take that long as well to do that. And so that's that. So that's the four steps for creating proxy. So something you need to be aware of once you set up with proxy is you need to inform the surgery about new member of staff who need uh, proxy accounts. Also, you need to inform the surgery about staff leaving your company as well or your care home. So they can be removed as well from uh, the proxy accounts. And the third thing, if you have like any new res residents as well in your care home, this needs to be as added to the proxy account because the, this proxy account allocate residents to each account for each member of staff who have a proxy account. So they will need to, to know about this. And all the forms are available on the NHS England website, which I have a link here. Um, things to remember once you set up proxy in your care home is if a resident passes away, they will automatically drop off on the access of the online user. So that's a proxy uh, account user. And if the resident moves to another surgery, they will also drop off automatically to uh, of the access of that user as well. So sometimes you have a resident that stays in practice, but goes to another home that is looks about another practice as well. And they would need to be removed manually as well from the uh, from the the access to that home as well. So you need to you would need to complete a form there and to send it to as well as surgery. All the forms, like I said, are available on the NHS England website. So be careful with staff changing homes as well, um, especially if they're both looked after the same practice. So old accounts must be deleted before the new ones are set up. So you we need to inform the surgery as well. And communication is still needed with the community pharmacy via secure email. So I would advise you, if you have an NHS email, each community pharmacy around the area in the BSSG should have an NHS email as well. So if you need to communicate with them about medication ordering as well, you will need, need that, that, secure, that secure email. Um, also, it would be good for you to have a designated person at a surgery you can contact. So that could be the prescription clerk, but most of the time it could be a pharmacy um, professional there because we have pharmacists and pharmacy technician working in each practice. So it'd be good for you to um, liaise with one of them. So if you have any problems with a proxy, with your proxy account or anything to do with proxy, or you have any query, you can contact them. And the seventh point there, it's uh, I would advise you uh, to have two or three users per care home. So that's recommended because if one of your staff is off sick, 
and the other one is not is on a day off, at least you get someone else that can order medication. So we advise for three per cow. But with the larger homes, we've got bigger homes sometimes, uh, for example, in Bristol, I would advise you to have two and three users per floor as well. So that depends on the size of the care home. But it's really important not to give proxy, uh, not to set a proxy account just for one user in the care home. It's always good to have two or three users as a backup. And so we come into how can we help you with proxy? So we can provide you support and advice. I'm here to provide you with any information needed or forms needed for, for the implementation of proxy. And we can provide, I can provide you as well with training demos. So I could train your staff and as well, I could come around the care home as well and show them what proxy looks like and what they need to do to order medication. And we can provide guidance and instruction at the same time. Uh, the other thing I want to tell you as well, uh, we have a team of digital service officer that support the care homes as well with proxy. They sit within one care uh, organization. So if I can't provide that support, there's other people that can support you as well with proxy. And then I've got questions. So I'm happy to take any questions now. There are a few questions, Kaz, on the yeah, uh, on the chat. Um, first of all, can more than three people be added to the system? Say that again. Sorry, I didn't hear. Can, can more than three people hmm. be added to the account? Yeah, it's possible. So you can have up to. There's no limit actually. So if you want to have a care, um, add eight people in your accounts with proxy, that's fine. Okay, thank you. And Daniel says, for proxy access, do staff ordering medication need to have their own account with their personal medical detail medication? Oh, that's an interesting question. Hmm. No, so that's not going to happen, really. Um, if I understand the question well, what you're going to have with proxy is just a proxy account to allow you to see your residents and their medication only. So that's not going to be possible. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be the, the individual needing to be proxy himself or herself? No, no. no. So it's uh, just going yes. to be that individual having proxy accounts for their residents. Yeah. Okay. They won't, um, be, ex access, they won't be able to access any other uh, users or themselves. <laughs> okay. Um, Peter's answered this question, but Nikki um, has asked, um, can this be used in supported living units as well? Yes. So <clears throat> we said care homes and care homes include residential home, nursing homes and assisted living. So anything with care yeah, in the care sector. Um, if you have any doubts, speak to your surgery. So it's up to the surgery if they want to set you up with proxy as well. But most of the surgery will be happy to do so because we're trying to, with the NHS, we're trying to move to, uh, to a digital uh, platform to use di everything digital. Yeah, so we're trying to get rid of the paper. Okay, thank you. And Katie is saying, does the resident or representative have to give permission for the home to use this system? That's a really good question. And I'm, I'm really glad someone asked this because I forgot to tell you about this. So with consent, Initially, when it was set up about two years ago, um, so someone said like each residence needs to have uh, to sign a consent form or their family representative. Um, but that's not the case now because all you're going to need is to uh, complete the data sharing agreement form. And the reason for that is because you already have consent within your home and you already have policies that you are responsible for ordering medication as you accept resident, admit residents in your care home. So you don't need consent from each resident, no. That should be the answer. Thank you. Does anybody have any more questions? That's all the questions that are on the chat. Um, people have been asking if slides can be shared. Are you happy yes, for your slides? Yes, yeah, I'm happy shared? with that. And if I have like one minute, mm -hmm. I'm happy to show you what proxy looks like. Um, yes, you do. Get there. Oh, it's not letting me. Right, where is? Here we go. Yeah. So once what you need to do to um, log into your proxy. So once you're all set up, 
with all the paperwork done initially, and you're all set up with proxy, all you're going to need to do is to log into your proxy is go to Google, uh, type patient access, and then you should uh, log in using your username and password. And he's asking me if I'm not a robot. Let me see. So he wants boats. Let's try to get that right. Well, we're waiting for this to come through. If anybody wants to have the slides, if you would like to put your email address into the chat, you can send it directly to me if you if you would prefer rather than share with anybody. It's entirely up to you. But please put your email address into the chat so I can send you the slides. Failing that, you can look at the slides on the members um, page on the Care and Support West website. Thank you, Karen. Sorry. OK, that's right. So just adding something to the slides, my slides have got links. So if you click on the links, you should be able to get all the steps and all the forms there. And if you're missing anything or you have any questions, you can email me as well. So once you log into proxy, this is the first screen you're going to get with your name on the top. By the way, I just need to mention there will be no confidential information here. We're talking about a dummy patient called Mickey Mouse. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to see. So here we go. So you've gone on the top, top right. You've got your name here and your link practice. So mine is a real practice here. Your linked user would be all your residents here. I only have one just for purpose of training here, Mickey Mouse. But you should have a list of all your residents here. So to order medication using proxy, what you need to do is switch to that resident. And it's very slow. Um, here we go. And then you go to the left here. And I'm happy to do that in your care home or via Team or Zoom, if you'd want to. Happy to repeat that, but it's straightforward. You go to the left here, repeat medication, click on it, go to your medication, just a reminder. And here we go. So you're going to have a list of all the medication for your resident here. So for example, Mickey Mouse, I've got uh, buprenorphine, carbocystin, and a uh, Depo here. So two ways to order, you can select all the medication and request, re re request all three of them. Or you can clear the selection if you made a mistake and you can add what you, or you can add what you want. Just to clarify, this is only for repeat medication any acute or anything else, you won't see, see it here, okay? So, or you can select what you want, for example, buprenorphine, I need it, request it. So if you remember, during my presentation, I talked about communication that would be improved. So once you order your medication here, you're gonna have a message for the practice. So in here, the message you're gonna type and send here with the medication, will appear on the GP screen or on the prescription clock screen. So for example, if you drop a tablet, you can say, need more um, because I dropped a tablet or dropped a few tablets, for example. Um, and then you order medication here. So click on order and you should, uh, I'm not going to order it here because it's going to go to a GP practice here, but mm -hmm. you just click on order and it's ordered. Good thing for audit trail as well. So if we go back one step, your medication, here we go, your orders, you can see an audit trail here. So you can see if your GP, for example, my GP here <laughs> rejected carbocystin for training purposes here, but um, <laughs> you can see if uh, it's been accepted or rejected. Once you see this is accepted, that means that's gone to the community pharmacy. So you won't have to pick up the phone and ring in the community pharmacy or GP practice to say, where's the prescription as you, you usually do. And you're probably going to spend half an hour if you're in a practice to get to someone to have that answer. The answer would be here. So if it's accepted and it's green, it means it's gone to, uh, to the GP, uh, community pharmacy. So you know that your prescription has been ordered, accepted, and it's, it sits with the community pharmacy now. And that's it. So this is what it looks like. Um, and that's it. Yeah. So I'm happy to take any more questions. There's, After, there's one, uh, yeah. I was going to say, there's one, one quick one. Um, will the, let's go, will the scripts be sent to your medication supplier as well as your 
your GP mm, practice? Yeah, that's a really good question again. So it was going to be sent straight to the GP practice. And um, I think there's conversation you need to have initially with the community pharmacy when you set this up. Because my understanding, is some of the orders go straight to the community pharmacy first, and then they go to a GP practice sometimes. So community pharmacy have a sort of, um, um, they can see the orders before they get to the surgery sometimes. And it's something that they keen to have because it's safe for them um, to have an overview of what's being ordered. So there's two ways around it. First way is you can communicate with them with NHS. Um, obviously, initially, when you set up, you need to inform them that you're going to move to proxy and you won't, ha you won't have to um, send the paperwork or the paper orders. Mm, okay. And the second thing is once you order, if they need that um, to know what's been ordered or what they're expecting, you could either PDF uh, your order. So there's a way to, once you order all this, you're gonna have a list here and you can PDF it, save it and send it through a secure NHS email to your community pharmacy NHS okay. email as well. The other way around it is either it's for the surgery <laughs> to grant access, proxy access to community pharmacy, but that's a conversation that needs to happen between the practice and the community pharmacy. Okay. okay. Um, one final question I keep coming yeah. through, but it's, it's worthwhile. Um, somebody has three care homes. Do they need more than one account or is it one account that covers the three care homes? No, each each individual ordering medication needs to have an individual account, if that's clear. OK. So, yes. for example, if I have um, Danny Smith needs to have a Danny.Smith Anishas.net account, and he needs to have a separate login. So if you have three care homes, I suspect you have different member of staff. So you you will need like uh, many accounts different for login. each. Yeah, yeah, different logins. Okay. Um, I'm just going to add also um, a little bit of knowledge. Um, many of you will know I've been contacting you with regard to the data security protection toolkit. If you haven't got NHS Mail. You need to do the toolkit before you can apply for NHS mail and you need NHS mail to be able to access proxy access. So it's like a stepping stone. So if you haven't completed the toolkit as yet, um, I'm your go to person if I can help you resolve that. OK, Kaz, thank you so much. Um, obviously, it's, it's of interest to a lot of people. And is going to save a lot of people, as you quite rightly say, taking time to get through to different people, finding out where the script is, what's happening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, it's um, it's going to save a lot of people. So, thank you very much for today. Can you stop sharing your screen? Yeah, that's please? right. I'm just going to add something. So, I'm going to add my email, okay, and my number to the slides. So. If you're experiencing any problem or you have questions, like happy, uh, feel free to email me or call me. Thank okay. you very much. That's perfect. Lovely. OK, so we're going to move on to Peter. Peter's. Are you ready, Peter? Yep, I'm ready. I just need to get the share screen. Okay. Accepted. Are you not? I thought I had. That yeah, says disabled participant okay. screen sharing. So. Apologies. My That's OK. There you go. There we go. Okay. okay. Yep. Just getting that ready. It's coming through. Yep. Perfect. Here we go, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say a massive thanks to Karen for organising this. And to Cassim, because actually he's done all my hard work for me, because he's just gone through and explained proxy access. So while he was talking, I was busy hiding all the slides that could kind of repeat exactly what he was saying. Um, so first of all, who's PillTime? So PillTime is an online pharmacy that puts all of your medicines into pouches in date and time order. So it makes it very simple for you to supply your medicines to your patients. What we do is we use lots of technology to let me just make sure this is working. Here we go. 
we use lots of technology to put the pouches together. There's like these really large machines that we use to automatically print these. Um, there's quite a complicated process that occurs within our, our facility that makes sure that all of the medicines that go in there are double checked. We use a lot of checking machines um, to make sure that there's no errors. Uh, we have, I, I, didn't, I, I hate using the statistic because it's almost like um, test, tempting fate, but in our new facility, which we moved into in July and got up and running, we have an error rate of less than, I think it's three in one million pouches which are then always caught by the pharmacist at the end anyway. So essentially we've tried to eliminate as much as humanly possible any chance of any errors. Okay, so we make the pouches using our machines. I don't know if this video is gonna play, but let's see, it kind of opens it up to everyone to say what we're doing. You can see, but can't hear. I don't think there's any sound on this. So. It's just showing the canisters that are actually used to make the, the rolls. So we get a better idea later on of why certain things when you're using the proxy access are important. So all of these steps are automated and all the checking occurs. So as you can see, the most important thing to take here is that we, we would need all of the prescriptions up front to make sure that we don't have to add in any prescriptions later because this process means that, and it's the same with all the modern kind of dosset packing, um, you need all the prescriptions up front to make these processes run efficiently so that we can make these at a, in a way that is still cost efficient. So as everyone's pulling more and more functionality away from the market, automation becomes more and more important. So you set up the pouches. Uh, there's the three different slots that you can see there. So you've got Monday morning, sorry, morning on a Tuesday, lunchtime on a Tuesday, and tea time at a Tuesday. Now I'll go on to how do you order your medication? Now this is the most important piece for uh, everyone in the home. So if you imagine that you've got your proxy access to all of your patients, the most important thing that you have to do to make sure your lives are as easy as possible is keep a record of whatever you're ordering. Because if the pharmacy doesn't receive an order to tell, to then feed back to you, you will never know how to check in against what you ordered. So it's really important up front to keep a record of everything that you've ordered. So when you receive everything, you can check it all in. There's a process called synchronization. Now, for facilities like ours and anyone else who's used to the, the, the normal dosset trays that you get, it's very important that we get a full set of prescriptions on the day of the month that you send over all of the prescriptions. The, the reason for this is it's very difficult for a facility like ours or even dosset in, in a pharmacy for them to start adding medicines in halfway through a cycle. So what you want is all of the medicines received up front. Now, we, for us, we produce a load of forms that you can then use in the surgery to get them to print you off a, an interim prescription to get you up to the point where you start. And then from then on, it's really important that they issue all of the prescriptions in one go. That makes when you go into proxy access really easy because what you'll do is essentially say, select all my medications. Um, all of the medications will be issued because you won't have any problems with overlaps and you know you're issuing this drug too early and when it comes to the pharmacy it means the pharmacy can actually pouch or pack all of your medicines in one go that's possibly the biggest tip that we can give pharmacies from what we view from all of our experience of dealing with homes the benefits of this as well it means the surgery will keep the records up to date as much as possible um, so like Kasim said earlier you'll have repeat medications and acute medications. And what happens there is that all the repeats are available for you to order through proxy. Now, a true acute should be something like a cream that is used for a one-off application, something like some antibiotics that you would only issue on a one-off case by case basis when you've had a, a consultation with a prescriber. 
So anything that's in the repeat section would be separated and actually shows up different in the doctor system. So I, it seems like most of the ones in Bristol are using EMIS. So they would have a, a repeat section and an acute section. And for the doctor, then it makes it very easy for them to issue a new prescription on a monthly basis. Also, so what you can also do is with your pharmacy, it's really good to let them know if there's a drug that's being newly issued that might change in dose so they can supply it in a full pack. So even though you're now able to order your prescriptions direct to the surgery, it's what you'll find is it's a really good idea to then speak to the pharmacy straight afterwards and say, actually, these three medicines that you might be getting, we want them outside of the Nomad or outside of the Dosset or outside of your pouching so that it can be done in a full pack. And that way, if any changes occur, you don't have the problem of having to unpick a pack or try and pick a tablet out of a medicine tray. So now the prescriptions have gone off to the doctor's surgery, so from your patient access, they'll go to the doctor's surgery. You'll be able to then keep an eye on when that prescription has been issued by your doctor's surgery. Now, companies like Pill Time um, and some of the other providers as well will have you use an online portal to log into. And this will give you an idea of all of the scripts that we've received for your patients. So this is just a test care home patients and there's nothing to worry about in terms of seeking anyone's data. So we can break it up by floors, wings, um, whichever way you'd like it to be broken up, to be honest with you. Uh, then inside there, you would have, we've got here, Peggy Mitchell, um, and it shows which medicines are currently being prescribed for her and which ones we've received prescriptions for. So quite quickly, you can log in and say, OK, I know that these have been issued by the doctor and now they're here and I can see which ones we're going to be sending out, which hopefully should make the life much easier for the people running the home. So you can see which medicines have been issued, which prescriptions we've received back. It matches up to what you ordered. And then you should be able to have quite a lot of confidence that when you receive your packs, you're not having to check in three different places to see that the if there's any issues. You only have to check that what you've received is what you've ordered. Now, the other benefit about electronic prescribing is you have, if you go to the doctor's surgery and you get an acute let's say for instance, because of the way that pharmacy nominations work, all of those prescriptions then go to the pharmacy. But you might need something much quicker than your normal pharmacy that's able to do your dossets can supply for you. So you may need to use a late night pharmacy. Because of the way that pharmacies work, if they've hit download on your pharmacy on your prescriptions, it could sit in their system and you'd have to actually wait for the pharmacy to reopen. Now at pill time, we don't download any prescriptions outside of our opening hours. So what you could do is ask the doctor's surgery for the code that's on your prescription and then go to any pharmacy and get that dispensed. And if you need it dispensed and somewhere like um, our pharmacy is open, what you can then do is ring the pharmacy up and ask them for the code and they'll give you the code. And also they would release the prescription back up to the spine so it can be collected any way you'd like, which makes the whole process of collecting interims much simpler and having a separate functionality of your repeats done by a different pharmacy. So this kind of goes a bit off topic, but the pouching does help with your teams. They always save a lot of time and makes it a lot easier for them. And you, what you'll end up doing is saving a lot of time in terms of how long the rounds take to be completed, because essentially you've got much less individual packs to give to the patient. So these are all statistics from uh, surgeries, sorry, nursing homes that we've been doing over the last year. So if you have any further questions, 
or if you'd like a demo, you can speak to us and email care at pill time and we would be able to come back to you. Um, I'd organize one of the team to contact you. So I, I know that's blasted through a little bit, but if there's any questions. Uh, Thank you, Peter. There are a couple of, yeah, there's a couple of questions. Let me stop the share. <clears throat> Thank you. There we go. Okay. So, um, question. Um, so, what areas do you cover for the system? Oh, we cover uh, the whole of the UK. So, the whole, actually, no, not the whole of the UK, whole of England. All right, I've okay. got to be clear on that one. <laughs> Thank you. I keep saying UK and then forget. <laughs> I always go back and say, uh, actually, excluding Wales okay. and Scotland. Um, <laughs> so, Tricia has asked if can you can you have set times put onto the pouches rather than just morning afternoon night actually our systems are really flexible so you can have um you can have as many different times as you'd like we're expanding the times that are available at the moment because we didn't we had 12 before but now we've kind of expanded it out because some people want to have some medicines in the middle of the night we have mm -hmm. um some very specific user cases which mean we need someone to have a medicine at seven o'clock at seven forty-five. Mm -hmm. uh we we'll cover everything pretty much so it doesn't okay. have to be a fixed time you get okay. complete ownership of the time slots okay Pippa so can this be used as an alternative to trays for non-care home patients oh yeah so a large part of our business I would say is generally direct consumer so we have I think it's more like 6,000, 7,000 patients that are direct to consumer. So that we deliver them direct to their house, to the door. And that's a big majority of what we use, what we do. Okay, thank you. And the million dollar question, is this free? Yeah, this is free, yeah, which is, yeah, why we have to use so much automation, it keeps it free, so. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, if there's no thank further questions. We have got um, a hand up, Karen, as well. We've oh, got, um, he's sorry. got a hand up. Oh. Kylie? Kylie? Hello. Um, we currently use Pill Time at the moment, and we get on really, really well with it. It's probably the best choice we made, to be honest. Um, what you. I wanted to ask, with the proxy ordering, so currently we have to send a copy of our repeats to Pill Time yeah. and to the prescription team. If we went with proxy ordering, are we still sending that copy to pill time or is it just all sent through the prescription team at the GP? See, it kind of, it depends on the GP surgery. If they turn the prescriptions around within um, a one day period. So what we have found is some GP surgeries that for some reason we'll receive one set of prescriptions in the morning and one set of prescriptions in the evening so we've put in a bit of tech to kind of group the prescriptions up together so you shouldn't okay. need to do both right perfect thank you no thanks Colin, um, by the way. Uh, one um further question nikki is asking does this come under cqc regulations and I guess Brian, who's our next presenter, can answer that question. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm going to, uh, yeah. <laughs> it would be good to speak to Brian afterwards every, as well, because there are there is like a bit of CQC question around it. But we feel that it, because it um, helps people stay more independent, especially for at-home users, it keeps them independent for longer. We find that they, they take their pouches. Um, we have really good compliance rates when you compare it to full pack. So if, as long as it keeps people at home longer and they're more compliant and they actually do get to understand their medicines, it's, um, yeah, we feel that we fit within that, but I'm sure you take difference of opinions. I mean, some people sit on one side of the fence, some people sit on the other side of the fence, but as long as it's moving the game forwards, we're, that's where we're at with it. So. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks. Okay, um, slightly out of, uh, we're running out of time, but we, I'm, really want to present you to Brian. Brian's got lots of information for you. I'm going to share your screen, your slides, Brian, for you. Thank okay. You, Can you see? Okay. Everybody happy with that? Yep. That's come up now. Lovely. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much, Karen. As, as you can see in the slide, I'm Brian, my name is Brian Brown. I'm a pharmacist specialist and I work for CQC in the medicines optimization team. 
and I'm going to try and present to you some of the common areas of medicines related risks and some of the issues we find on inspection in adult social care. But I also want to talk to you a little bit about the background to CQC and update you on some of the changes that are going to take place and I'll talk to you briefly about our new regulatory model that we're moving forward to. So can the next slide please? And so you're, I'm sure you're aware we are actually the independent regulator for health and social care in England. And we're there to make sure that health and social care providers provide patients and service users with safe, effective, compassionate and high quality care. And where they do not, we encourage them to improve. We are moving forwards and we published a strategy in May 2021 about um, how we're going to regulate in the changing world of health and social care. And we're actually being ambitious, but it's built on four things, which are people, communities, smarter regulation, accelerating improvement and safety through learning. And these are all published on our website. Go on to the next slide, please. As part of that, we're going to be moving towards a new regulatory model. And there's three main reasons why we need to change is we need to make things simpler so we can focus on what really matters to people. We need to reflect better how care is actually delivered by different types of services as well as across a local area. And we need one framework that connects our registration activity to our assessment of quality as a service is actually delivering the service. So currently we have a number of inspection frameworks and they're detailed and complex and there's lots of duplication across them. And what we want to do is move to a sim single framework with a single set of expectations and a definition of quality across all of health and social care and the systems are surrounding it. So we're going to be we're also moving away from a inspection frequency based on ratings to an approach around continual assessment and the ability to update ratings and judgments more dynamically to respond quicker to risk and to improvements to services. And our inspections and site visits will still, still be the main part of our approach, but we'll have increased monitoring, so we'll have more contact with services with less, without necessarily being inspections. Site visits won't always be required to gather evidence. We be, we'll spend more time observing care, how staff interact with people, how equipment's used and what the environment's like to get a proper feel of what the service is doing. And we're also going to move away from long narrative reports to shorter reporting formats on findings and an update of ratings. Move to the next slide. So as I said before, we have a, a single assessment framework. We're going to call, we, we've confirmed that we're going to keep our quality ratings and we're going to still be looking at our five, five key questions. So that's safe, effective, caring, responsive and well-led. But we, we, we're going to replace our existing key lines of inquiries and prompts with new quality statements. And this will reduce the duplication that's in our four current separate assessment frameworks to allow us to focus on specific topic areas under each key question and we'll link to the reg relevant regulations to make it easier for providers. And we call the quality statements we statements as they're written from a provider's perspective to help them understand what we expect of them. And they draw, they draw on previous work which we developed with, with external providers to make, and we want to maintain our ethos when developing our new assessment framework. We importantly base our assessments of quality in all types of services in all levels on this single framework. And for local authorities and integrated care systems, we'll actually use a subset of those quality statements when we're inspecting those as well. So to make our judgments more structured and consistent, we've also developed six categories for the evidence we collect, which is looking at people's experiences, feedback from staff and leaders, observations of care, feedback from partners, looking at processes and looking at the outcomes of care. But to fulfill the ambitions in our strategy, we, we need to emphasize that the need to create cultures that learn and improve. And we set expectations for how services and providers need to work together and within systems to plan and deliver effective person centered care. Move on to the next slide, please. So, particularly for myself, we're looking at how we inspect, it will inspect. In, 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 inspecting the medicines. So it will sit under the key question of safe and it's going to talk about people how people feel safe 
and they're supported to understand and manage their risks around medicines. So safety is a priority for everyone and leaders embed a culture of openness and collaboration. People are always safe and protected from bullying, harassment, avoidable harm, neglect, abuse and discrimination, and their liberty is protected where this is in their best interest in line with legislation. And people have been allowed to raise concerns about safety and ideas to improve, and their primary response should be to learn and improve continuously. And people being supported to make choices that balance risks of harm with positive choices about their lives and making sure that there are enough skilled people to deliver safe care that promotes choice, control and individual well-being. Under the quality statements, there's one on medicine optimization, which is talking about we make sure that medicines and treatments are safe and meet people's needs, capacities and preferences by enabling them to be involved in planning, including when changes happen. So particularly under that evidence, under the evidence categories, then we're going to be looking at people's experience of health and care services and defining what people's experience as being a person's needs, expectations, lived experience and satisfaction with their care and support and treatment, which also includes access to transfers between services and access to services. We're going to look at the quality of care and are both on-site or off-site and the combination of both. We'll continue to call on-site visits to gather evidence inspections. So there won't be any change to that terminology, but what we'll, we'll be focusing more on is the outcomes for people, focusing on the impact of the care process on the individual and how that care that's been provided to them has affected that person's physical, functional or psychological status. We move on on to medicines errors. This, sorry, next slide, please, Karen. Medicines errors can include prescribing, dispensing, administration, and monitoring errors. So, if you can click on the slide, it should take it. It should um, open up the next. These these figures are from 2017, and as you can see from here. There are roughly 237 million medicines errors occur in the NHS every, in England every year, of which 28% was moderate or serious harm and 712 deaths potentially and contributing to an additional 1,700 deaths. If we click again, please, Karen. But at the moment, this only tells us a story about the NHS. It doesn't include any information around social care services and errors in, within social care services. And from that, we are aware that medication errors occur where meet weak medication systems or human factors such as fatigue, poor environmental conditions or shortages affect prescribing, transcribing, dispensing, administration and monitoring, which can then result in severe harm, disability or even death. Medicines optimization, as it's now known, is, is a framework around which safer medicines practice can be put into place to deliver the best outcomes for people. We, if we move on, please, Karen. Although we've got no information being collected centrally, um, we produced a report in June 2019 called Medicines in Health and Adult Social Care. And that allowed us to pick out six key themes around risk areas around medicines. So it's about prescribing, monitoring, and reviewing, the administration of medicines, the transfer of care between settings, reporting and learning from incidents, the storage, supply, and disposal of medicines, and particularly around staff competence and workforce capacity. If we'd like to kind of move on to the next slide, when particularly looking around reporting and learning from incidents. Within CQC, when we, we, we come back to you and we ask you to tell us about uh, how many errors have you had in the past 12 months, for instance, Mr. Sist, and there's no, there, we're not saying you need to notify us of er all errors, but however, each service should have a system in place to actually monitor how many errors are occurring within that service and what their response to it is. There are only certain, er cer there are only certain categories of errors that need to be notified to us and I've listed those on the screen there. However, often we find in when we talk about recording errors within, within the PIR, 
In residential services, 47.2% said they had zero errors. And for administration errors, residential services said 42.9% then said they had zero errors. Now, from a statistical point of view, we appreciate that medicine errors are inevitable. However, we're keen to see how leadership within an organization promotes an open and honest safety culture that supports the safe and secure handling of medicines. And whilst a single medicine error may result in no harm, a number of the same type of errors can, made in quick succession within the same organization may prompt further investigation or root cause analysis. Particularly, what we would like to reinforce is a low reporting rate from an organization should not be interpreted as a safe organization because it actually may represent underreporting. Subsequently, a high reporting rate isn't always isn't interpreted as being an unsafe organization because it may actually represent a culture of greater openness. Therefore, what we would encourage is that providers encourage people to report medicines errors unless there's a and, and unless that there's a clinical medical review that hasn't been determined there's been no harm to the person. But actually it's about still within that service having a system in place to develop and and um, improve on to reduce those errors. Can we move on to the next slide, please. We talked earlier on the earlier slide that at the moment there's no, no way of picking up on those errors in social care services. Moving forwards, there will that there's actually there will be a system called learning from patient safety events service, which will allow social care providers to actually document any errors onto that system, which will then, which will then allow um, national learning to take place um, from information that's been, been um, uploaded to that system. So, yes, you can have a copy of the slides. Um, and providers will be able to access data that's been submitted by their teams in order to better understand their local recording practices and culture and to support local safety improvement work. And also, if we're recording safety events, whether they result in harm or not, it provides insight into what can go wrong within health and social care and the reasons why, which allows us to then look at un either new, new or under-recognized safety issues to be identified quickly and acted upon in an NHS wide scale, but also in England wide scale, because the, they can pick up on those errors from, from wherever they're coming from. Use the next slide. This is some of the common areas where we identify issues on inspection. One is around delegation. So some medicines cannot be routinely administered by a care worker, for example, injections such as insulin or medicines administered by feeding tubes, because they're seen as clinical or nursing tasks. However, nurses can delegate the administration of these medicines to care workers, but it must be in the best interest of the person. And there must also be appropriate systems in place to support that, including training and competency assessments. Okay. And medicines, or sorry, and medicines audit. Providers are required to have effective governance, which includes audit processes. They must measure practice against good standards and identify areas for change. And particularly around the safety and quality of medicines use, but often we, we don't look, not so much looking for completed checklists and all the same audit being completed every, mo every month in and now, but it's, it's what we're looking for is to, if they're identifying issues and areas for change on an audit, that they're then re-audited against that change and whether it's been improved or not. What is very, what, what doesn't show, what often we find is the same issues being identified on an audit from month, one month to the next month without it actually changing. We go on to the next slide, please. So you know, the, another uh, two areas we, where we find issues are, is around um, when medicines are being covertly. So people are being showing be given medicines covertly when they've been assessed as lacking capacity to make decisions. But people, it should also be recognised that people have the opportunity, have the right to make an on what, what could be seen as an unwise or foolish decision. But it's about what's in their best interest then if they do lack capacity, and it needs to be made for if, if they do want to do medicines. 
covertly, the decision may, needs to be made for each individual medicine, not all medicines as a grouping. And then the application of topical medicines such as creams or patches. So it's about making sure that staff have the right information to help them do that effectively, completing records co correctly and consistently, and storing those methods appropriately. Often with patches, we find that they, we, the services may record where they're applying them, and when they, we often find they don't record when they remove them, and there's no checks that they um, have remained in place during the during the during the period which the patch is is prescribed for. And also, we find that often there's no clear indication as to where it's been as to the location it's being applied. So it doesn't always follow the, the appropriate um, timescales between applications on the same site. One we would like you to think about is, especially is the fire risk associated with emollient creams. It's been known about for many years, but we've started to be made aware quite recently of the death of another person living in the care home due to burns sustained when they became engulfed in flames. And it's thought that a contributory factor was the regular use of emollients. And unfortunately, the, this person went, went out, it was, um, smoking went out, and the, 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 they, were, they were engulfed in flames within from, from dropping, dropping cigarette ash. It's thought the contributory factor was the regular use of emollients and the reluctance to the person to bath or to change their clothes. Therefore, that increased the likelihood of the buildup of products in their skin or clothes. There's a link on here which taught, which gives you a, um, which is produced by the, um, by, by the mental health, by, by the NHRA, but it's also produced it's in conjunction with the fire, fire safety officers, and it gives you an explanation of where the risks come through. So I would encourage you to look at that. Move to the next slide. Some of the things that we'd also like you to think about is actions for care staff. So it's about risk assessments and care planning around about the use of emollient creams, use, especially thinking about emollients for in, in emergency evacuation plans and report any fire instances you have with emollients or other skin for using the yellow card scheme. There is also on our website a link to um, a patient safety, patient learning from safety incident around risk of emollient, uh, high risk from use of emollient creams. But there are also other examples on our website of these learning safety, learning from safety incidents around improper use of equipment, unsafe bed rails, burns from hot water, caring from pe for people at risk with choking, falls from windows and hypothermia. Another slide which talks about how to use emollients safely, and particularly here is around about making sure that you mitigate against risk around potentially use of fire retardant blankets for people who, who do smoke, for instance. I'm not gonna talk any more about that slide because I think it's important that you, but you're gonna have them shared to you. And what I would like to bring to you at the end, move on please, Karen, is we have a, a number of medicine information pages which have been grouped together according to service type and most information however is transferable if you look at the right hand side of the page you will see the website if you look at the you'll see the picture of what the website looks like and if you want to access the page it's if you without the link then you, you go onto the cqc page and looking on the section where it says guidance for providers, click on adult social care and at the very bottom of there, you'll see one that says medicine information pages. And we produce those, we produce these, these information pages based on topics that we either have identified through inspections or from the number of inquiries we receive into, into, in, within to CQC. Okay, thank you, Karen. Any questions? Thank, Thank you, Brian. You. Yeah, there's a couple, aren't there, on the chat? Just really around the, the sharing of the slides, which, Brian, you said kindly that yes. that would be great for sharing. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So and going back to the question that was asked before at the end of the pre uh, previous presentation, 
within C as CQC, we do not specify, we do not prescribe how any service operates their system. What we look at is, is the system within the service being operated safely. That's, that's okay, that's great. Um, very useful to know. Thank you, Brian. Um, I, I'm, I, I don't know if there's any more questions. On, there's nothing on the chat. Has anybody got any questions they'd like to raise their hand and ask Brian about? Now's your chance. He's here. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. Um, yeah, interesting, isn't it? The 44% it, uh, report no, no um, errors at all. And how that's deemed is actually that makes you more suspicious than than yes, yes. anybody having a, a an error. So that is something to take away, everybody. They're not here to slap your hands; they're here to help you. Um, okay. So if we don't have any more questions, um, well done, guys. We're bang on time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop recording.